Not many people have the chance to study a real human skeleton. In this video, we examine some beautiful human bones from a teaching kit. You will have a chance to learn about their distinctive geometries, functions, and load-carrying features. Let's start by looking at the human hand. It consists of 27 bones. This first group of eight individually named bones are collectively known as the carpals, and they allow the wrist to move and absorb impact. Next, five metacarpals form the paddle-shaped portion of the hand, and finally, we have the 14 phalanges with their flexible joints. These joints allow our fingers to produce movements that are both accurate and exquisite. Next, let's consider the feet. Each contains 26 bones, similar to those in the hand, but structured for strength rather than flexibility. Again, the bones fall into three categories, called tarsals, metatarsals, and phalanges. The uppermost tarsal, called the talus, makes contact with two long bones in the lower leg, the tibia and fibula, forming the ankle joint. Notice how these long bones wrap around the sides of the talus to produce a joint that is strong and stable. Like all joints, its motion is controlled by a set of ligaments. Only the tibia extends all the way up to the knee, the largest and most complex joint in the body. The patella, or kneecap, found at this joint, improves the leverage of the quadriceps muscles that extend the knee. Next, we have the femur, the largest and strongest bone in the body and all by itself it carries the forces in your leg from the knee to the hip. During each step that you take, and during many other activities, it carries compressive loads that are several times your body weight. It can also be called on to carry high bending and high torsion loads. Engineers who study mechanics know that the most efficient structural shape for carrying this combination of loads is a hollow circular tube. And that is exactly the cross-sectional shape of a femur. The ends of the femur carry a range of different contact loads depending on joint position and activity. What do you think would be a good structural design for these areas? You might want to pause the video and give this some thought. Would you like to see the internal structure of a real human femur? Well, it looks like this. Notice the thin, strong surface that exists where the contact forces act and the porous structure that supports it from beneath. We call this porous bone cancellus, or spongy bone, and the dense bone that covers the surface of the bone is called cortical, or compact bone. No space is wasted in the body, and the hollow cavities in long bones, like this femur, are filled with marrow. If you look carefully, you can even see the small holes through which blood vessels entered and exited this bone. The bones of the upper limb are called the radius, ulna, and humerus. And, as you can see, they have many structural features in common with the bones of the lower limb. The limbs attach to the torso through ball and socket joints at the hip and shoulder. At the hip, the socket side of the joint sits deeply into the pelvis, a strong and highly stable structural system. It is composed of the sacrum and two symmetric sets of three bones, called the ilium, pubis, and ischium. The shoulder joint, unlike the hip, is optimized for flexibility rather than strength. The socket on the scapula is more open, and the scapula itself can move relative to the rib cage, controlled in part by the clavicle. This is an inexpensive model, and, as you can see, it is missing many of the finer details that real bones would have. The last of the skeletal bones we need to examine are the vertebrae, ribs, and skull. Vertebrae are complex bones that routinely carry high compressive loads, up to five times body weight. 
To accommodate these loads, they have special joints that include flexible discs. Muscles and ligaments attach to projections on the vertebrae and control their movements. The openings, or foramen, in these bones provide special protection for the spinal cord and in the neck region for vessels that supply blood to the brain. Ribs attach to some of the vertebrae and provide support and protection for vital internal organs such as the heart and lungs. Lastly, we have the skull, the apex of the human skeleton. It provides a rigid bony shell around that most vital and delicate of organs, the brain. In case you are interested, here are the trio of bones, the malleus, incus, and stapes, that form part of the inner ear. They are the smallest of the 206 bones in the human body. Did you know that a trained forensic scientist can tell a lot about a person from a single bone? Depending on the bone, they might be able to tell a person's age, height, sex, race, details of any skeletal injuries, and even something about the kind of work they did and their cause of death. For example, by comparing these two femurs, it is easy to tell which person was taller. The strong detailing where the muscles would have attached to this femur indicates that it is from a male and that he was physically active. These vertebrae also have a story to tell. The malformations on them may have been triggered by overloading of the spine. Many hundreds of students have learned from these bones, and we are grateful to the person who donated this body to medical science so that others could benefit. Oh, and one more thing. Regarding the processes that give bones their distinctive shapes, how do you think they originally came into being? Did they arise spontaneously? Are they the work of a clever designer? What do you think? We hope you enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching.